This is not a catalogue essay or a history lesson. It is a critical confrontation with a question I have on the occasion and occupancy of a Dublin heritage site by two artists, Alan Phelan and Mark Swords. What does it mean to make, place and be solicited by contemporary art in a heritage site? I'm directing this question, which is made up of many other questions, at these two artists who are two art friends, friendship built on art, not on other social bonds. Although I am conscious of being critical for the sake of criticality in a performative way, I see this invitation to write as a rare opportunity to ask questions about art conditioned and made in response to its setting and site specificity. Is this an occasion of contemporary art or merely decoration? The heritage site in question is named the Casino at Marino, a neoclassical temple doing what postmodern architecture has been accused of doing for the last 50 years, robbing the culture of the past, augmenting it and slapping it back onto the present, like Doric columns and golden eagles on a 1970s semi-detached. And yet we have been postmodern, post for short, ever since the Romans rebooted the Greeks. The question in question is, is something lost in the reboot? What some call the originary context, motivation, passion, soul. What is lost in the shuffle of past and present? Words like shuffle come easy when discussing a building named Casino, Little House in Italian, gambling establishment in English elsewhere in space and time. The cards shuffled in this pleasure house from the feudal years of its colonial conception were dealt by the lords if not ladies of the manor. The casino provided or nor for the few who ruled and harvested resources and cultures of others reified in the casino's five-pointed star parquet floor presented in the casino as deep fake lino, but underneath made from inlaid timber procured from the near and far reaches of the British Empire. Yet beyond the leisure and pleasure economy of the colonial class, far, far away from the little house on the prairie, the modern English word casino, located underneath its idyllic and modest Italian etymology, interests me most in respect to the two artists, Phelan and Swords, who are responding to this building with its architectural sleight of hands and conservational deepfakes. The so-called little house built on the big house of colonialism seems like the biggest excess. From sniper range to casino at Marino seems modest relative to the mother empire that gave birth to it, but this is an illusion, an aesthetic indulgence of the board. Within Swiss army knife range the devil is in the unfolding detail. The little house becomes pick your empire metaphor, a TARDIS, a matryoshka, a clown car. What looks like one grand door fitting up the rhizomatic roots of colonialism is in fact a small door within a big door. What looks like one story with one room is in fact three stories and sixteen rooms. If there is anything functional here, like the column drain pipes, it is disguised by the decorative, which brings me back to one of two questions posed earlier, with a slight addition. Is this an occasion of contemporary art, or merely decoration upon decoration? Speaking with the artists Phelan and Swords who are responding to the casino with both existing and new work, they speak of history, mending and repair within the context of a building which, for an age, looked out on an empire where the sun never set. Phelan and Swords come wrapped up in their own histories and contemporary anxieties, which they have been invited to transpose onto a historical trinket that casts colonial shadows in all directions, a building celebrated today for its architecture and survival of war and rebellion that transitioned this country from colony to independence. What I do know at this juncture January 2024, when the artists are still discussing their work in progress in an effort to try to habituate themselves to the space and context, is that Swords is a crafter gone rogue, and Phelan is an archivist gone off script. The casino at Marino proffers an opportunity to go rogue and off script, yet within the constraints and compromises of a heritage site with its do not tamper walls and picture hanging systems, how rogue and off script can Phelan and Swords go? The whole heritage situation brings to mind the recent memory of Berlin Opticians, a curator-led online gallery that occasionally had group exhibitions at heritage sites in Dublin and neighbouring counties. Berlin Opticians accidentally found themselves in heritage sites because the curator's day job as executive officer of the Royal Society of Antiquaries was interconnected with heritage sites. The Berlin Opticians exhibitions were not radical per se, involving a stable of individual artists that were not driven by collective purpose, 
or ideology, except for perhaps a market-driven one. But their art opening somehow radically enticed artists to turn up in their droves, like an accidental relational aesthetics. Phila and Swords find themselves in a heritage site on the roll of a dice, which begs the question, is this an opportunistic or authentic response? And in the gamble and risk of the opportunist, what results in terms of contemporary art? John C. Welchman uses gambling to explore the cathartic effect in the aesthetics of risk. The cathartic effect of the experience is confirmed even in circumstances in which the odds of success are calculable, such as gambling as the individual is connected to chance operations that provide otherworldly stimulus in an otherwise controlled environment. If we dramatize the clandestine and subterranean gambling activity that might take place in such an establishment casino in today's parlance suggests a den of possible inequity. The modern casino spins on a die. This little casino overlooking Marino is a five-pointed star pointing to the losers and Charlie Sheens of colonialism. If we use cathartic effect to question Phelan and Soar's proposal to exhibit in this space, not just as an opportunity to politely and obediently display work within the display constraints of a heritage site, but to conceptually and aesthetically reflect and interrupt the socio-historical script that the tour guides will surely perform during the summer months run of the exhibition, we might get a little closer to why institutional constraints and limits lead us to produce catharsis, whereas freedom to do what one wants induces the vertigo that comes with such freedom. In this respect, masochism has close ties to the aesthetic of constraint or what the original masochist Sacker Masoch called a contract. The masochist was born into the literal law of the father. Sacker Masoch's dad was police. We can get all Freudian here, but putting dad aside, masochism, which has its own aesthetic enriched by Masoch's literary leanings, needs institutional constraints and limits in order for an aesthetic of arousal to take hold. What cathartic effect of aesthetic of arousal undergirds Phelan and Soar's motivation to exhibit work at the casino at Marino? Is it significant that Phelan and Soares are artists represented by commercial galleries where other display constraints based on market-driven forces condition the state of play? Is the casino at Marino a novel opportunity to display work in a setting that is not refrigerated from the outside world but comes with its own aesthetic and historic strangleholds? And more generally, what pleasure does the artist get from the public display of their work in either commercial or heritage spaces? Contemporary art is both built on a rejection of the institution and its acceptance. The fleeting moment of art needs a house, a home, a museum to protect it from here into perpetuity. But what is art after the event of its lively and public intrusion upon the world? What does art become? An object? A memory? An artifact that represents a time, a people, a place, a race, a class, a trauma. When Soar's work in its rogue craftiness speaks of mending and repair, we can include reparation here in the colonial context of its display. Would a more felt cathartic effect in response be the raising of the casino at Marino out of existence? Welchman, again. Cathartic experience grants permission for institutionalized experiences of freedom, outpourings of grief, fear or happiness that are generally transacted in specified temporal and spatial zones. Is this outpouring of emotion within the constrained yet cathartic limits of the institution therapeutic, cultural or just something to document or archive for future generations to experience under the helm of an AI tour guide? Should we raise history or archive it? What side of history are feeling and swords on? Such absence combined with the fleeting life of live culture and art, the need to document and archive is always present in order to make present, to make history. Yet all documentation cannot become part of the archive, a history with so much history up for grabs. The final archive can only document some and leave out others. The administration always prioritizes the visible over the invisible when it comes to the dead. Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher of deconstruction and difference, fell into an intellectual fever when the prospect of death could not be denied anymore due to oncoming old age and illness. The spectre of his father's death of pancreatic cancer aged 74 would be doubly fated when Derrida would die by the same disease at the same age. Towards death, Derrida became obsessed with the idea of the archive in the heated archiving of his own work. He even wrote a book named Archive Fever, a Freudian impression, in 1995. 
The archive for Derrida is a compulsive, repetitive, nostalgic, irrepressible desire to return to the origin, a homesickness, a nostalgia for the return of the most archaic place of absolute commencement. It is also a question of the future, a question of a response, of a promise and of a responsibility for tomorrow. Is the casino at Marino an archive? Derrida again. It is thus in this domiciliation, in this house arrest, that archives take place. The dwelling, this place where they dwell permanently, marks this institutional passage from the private to the public, which does not always mean from the secret to the non-secret. It is what is happening right here when a house, the Freud's last house, becomes a museum, the passage from one institution to another. Institution begets institution, artists beget art, culture begets archive. Life begets death. Feeling begets swords. Question begets question. What does it mean to make place and be solicited by contemporary art in a heritage site? Culture's conservation as dusty civilization or civilization's subjugation as lively culture. In an imaginary sense, the word casino, presided over by the uptight and tight-lipped functionary of the 18th century casino versus the gasping heart and sweaty brain of the modern casino goer and gambler, summons time travel. The casino of times past and present brings to mind the risk and radicality and catharsis of the gamble of contemporary art. To gamble the present and the future on the throw of a dice or on the flip of a card is a radical act. To make art in the present without distance, reflection and history on your side is also a radical act. There is nothing to lose. The present is all that matters. The future reception of art by the public is speculative at best in the artist's absence. Artists are forever throwing dice. What side the die lands on is dependent on where you stand in relation to where the die lies.